So what we decided to do was to come up with a uh, with a situation where Federation personnel, Starfleet officers, were invited to come in to uh, an area that they weren't particularly all that welcome in, and an area in which they weren't all that comfortable in. What the hell do you people intend to accomplish here? The sets that have been created for Deep Space Nine are very realistic and nearly functional. The main sets that are part of the show are where we're sitting in now. This is Ops, and that's short for Operations. I'm actually sitting in Chief O'Brien's um, panel here, and if I were to press some of these buttons, some very wonderful things might happen. This guy here, he's, he's, he's not there now, but he's, I mean, he pulls the doors open. But they work, yeah. No, 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 no. I think the sick part of it is you start to kind of, because these sets are so real, you kind of start to go, yeah, we are in a station. We are in space, isn't it cool? And we're all dressed in uniform all the time anyway, so. It's playing pretend all day long. When I started this show, my son was three and a half months old. And that's the first thing he comes on the set all the time because that's when I get to see him. And the first thing he did was look at it and touch it, poke it, and then he laughed. And that was the last time he ever made mention of my nose. It was like, okay, that's what mama wears when she's at work. Then a visitor also has to wear alien garb. These are the Bajoran uniforms which come in you get lovely gray or you get a lovely rust. For some of the Deep Space Niners, these outer space outfits aren't all that foreign. You see, a couple of them wore these space fashions while on Star Trek The Next Generation, and they seem to welcome the wardrobe change. These are great because if you gain a little weight, no one can tell. Well, it's, it's looser. It's a lot looser. The, 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 the top part of, of Next Generation space is really... They also seem to like um, the new, what we refer to as the utility uniform, which is the new one-piece jumpsuit, which is made out of a lightweight wall gabardine. Once the costumes are complete, the characters come out. I'm a major and I'm the first officer. Um, and I'm also not Federation, so uh, I'm not always politically correct. He's the uh, chief of security, yeah, and he's a shapeshifter. He is, uh, comparatively, I suppose, of the major captains, is very, very human. Shows, wears what he feels. Cisco to security. Go ahead. Uh, I need a couple of officers to go on a rescue mission to Bajor. Report to run about Pad C. On our way. One of the most stimulating personalities on Deep Space Nine is Quark. He's the local club owner and loves to scam on women. I am sort of Sam Malone, and I have his good looks as well. I, I have my own establishment. I have a lot of lovely female types coming in and out of the bar all the time. I make a great deal of gold. Very well, very well. Perhaps we could discuss these new rules over a drink. <laughs> if you don't take that hand off my hip, you'll never be able to raise a glass with it again. <laughs> pig is the right word. <laughs> my, my character's a pig. <laughs> You forget the thing! All right. You look so gross, those teeth. In this scene, uh, with Rick Colby, who's directing, wonderful director, um, I'm meeting a very lovely uh, Boslik, which is a new race to our show, Boslik Freighter Captain. Now, Leslie, could you go for his earlobes? That's, that's where you normally don't grab him, but just caress him as you come in. With my hands? Yes. Just because he's a chauvinist pig doesn't mean Quark isn't a sensitive 24th century kind of guy. Oh, very sensitive to my ears. Oh, yeah, yeah. Action, please. Hi, Quark. How are you, Lobes? England at the sight of you. And I get away with murder most of the time. Most of the time. No, my nemesis, Odo, has a way of sitting on me. Um, but most of the time I can get away with a lot of things. I need a slimy character like him, and he needs me chasing after him. In this scene, you see, there's a lot of turmoil down on the planet, and one of the major Federation officers is missing, and they're all looking for her. But you know who comes in to save the day? Just wait and see. <laughs> Good. When's Odo due back? Uh, 12 hours. Who needs Odo? 
when you got his number one deputy. Not everyone feels that way, Quark. <laughs> Bonds do form quickly when you're stuck on the outer limits of the universe, especially after their hiatus. Terry I haven't seen for ages, so today is the first day I've seen Terry in three months. So we had a fond welcome today, and so, uh, yeah, we're affectionate now. Ten months' time, we'll see what we're like. You know, both on a personal level and on an acting level, we, we kind of, we, we, we gel pretty fast. So it's, it feels like we've been doing it for a long time. We'll meet the humans behind the aliens and check out some amazing special effects when Inside Star Trek returns. Up on the top shelf, we have uh, a whole row of Ferengi heads. Don't I look beautiful? What do you think? I'm Michael Kastner, and you're watching Ease Look Inside Star Trek. Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Deep Space Nine are not only some of the most popular shows on television, they're also among the most expensive to produce. Creating the illusion of the future and filling it with fantastic creatures doesn't come cheap. But more important than the budget on shows like these are the creative minds who bring these worlds and their inhabitants to life. Hello, I'm Michael Westmore, the makeup designer and department head of Deep Space Nine and The Next Generation. There's a difference in the type of work we're doing now as opposed to 25 years ago. And I would think one of the biggest differences is the materials we have now are far more advanced, far more developed, and we have more time, we have bigger budgets. Oh, five after seven. See you in three hours. Three hours later, what do you think? It was worth it. Every moment. I gotta go to work. Uh, they make me go to work after three hours of sitting there. This is the easy part. The makeup is the hard part. It takes an hour and a half to put on. It, yeah, but that's my whole makeup. And the fact is that my skin has to be matched to this and it has to be built up so that there's not a line. And uh, they do an amazing job. I'm generally in, if, if everything is, is going right, I'm in at 5.45, and I'm in makeup for an hour and 15 minutes, and then on the stage for anywhere between 13 and 18, 20 hours. It's a rash, and I'm embarrassed about it. We tried to cover it. It wouldn't work. Um, they <laughs> had a forehead on me, and um, Paramount apparently just went, ah, what did you do to her face? The process has, has evolved over the years from really being a pain to where it's, it's actually tolerable. People say, oh, does it hurt? Is it hot? Is it this? Is it that? It's, um, it feels like you have a cold. And actually, today I do have a cold. So it feels like I have a double whammy cold. A lot of actors have told me that they have in their makeup felt claustrophobic. Claustrophobic. I can't even say that word. Okay, so it's not always comfortable. Even so, the cast members willingly forego their own creature comforts for the sake of Michael Westmore's vision. This is our alien called the Trunkhead. It's one of the more interesting, I think, and more difficult aliens that we have on the show. Oh, yeah, this would be like a Fellini movie in a minute. Yeah. If you've ever done body work on cards, you know what Bondo is. For the skin game, this is facial bondo. This is a very crucial step in the makeup where my back starts to go out. Once the trunk head's tedious and time-consuming makeup session is over, they're faced with an even bigger challenge. And so is their creator. I think the more you do, the easier it gets because you get into a role where you think all of a sudden I'm burnt out and I can't think anymore. And kind of it started to get that way after the first season. You think I've, I've made as many bumps as I possibly can. But then the more research books that you start to delve through and you start to go through, it does. It starts to get to the point where I, I more or less take it for granted. It's like, okay, we need 18 new aliens. All right, you know, sit down and we'll, we'll put them together. Hi, I'm Dan Curry, visual effects producer for Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine.